Good morning, everyone. Uh, Borada. Uh, hi there, John. I understand, uh, John, you're um, you're down with COVID at the moment. I am indeed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I hope you're feeling okay or reasonably okay. Uh, very fe much feeling better now. Yeah. Okay. Well, we very much appreciate that you're able to join us this morning. So, John no is a is a is a microbiologist uh, by training, and uh, has a passion for engagement. And I know uh, one of his um, projects uh, in 2019, uh, he had a live event uh, at the St. David's Two uh, Centre in Cardiff uh, called Superbugs. And uh, uh, that was a very successful uh, event supported by the Welcome Charity. And uh, John, uh, if you'd like to uh, tell us a little bit more about um, what you're doing with um, uh, your research and uh, with the Superbugs project. Uh, yeah, uh, hi everybody. I'm I'm John Tyrrell. I'm a, a microbiologist uh, working out of Bristol University, and uh, and I work with uh, Professor Matthias Eberl, uh, who works in Cardiff University. Who I think wasn't going to be online, but is I think in the chat. Are you able to say hello, Matthias? No, does not look like it. He's having some IT issues. Um, yeah. So uh, as as James said, a part of, we. We uh, we sold this session as uh, an interactive session where you were supposed to be interacting with me in the lab, but sadly uh, I came down with with COVID last week, pretty uh, unwell with it as well. So that let that be a cautionary tale to everyone that uh, that you know the pandemic really isn't over. Um, and whilst I'm better, thank God, um, I'm still positive for LFTs. So you've got a boring sort of presentation from me at home. Um, and and I, I'm still a little bit chesty, so you'd be glad to know that I won't be singing. Uh, I wouldn't have been singing even if I wasn't chesty. I don't think I'd quite live up to the performance from previous. Um, so yeah, I, I, as James mentioned, we're going to sort of slight change in pace and talk to you a little bit about a project, um, and a public engagement research project that, that we work on called Superbugs. And the aim essentially is to, to educate various demographics of the, of the public, whether that be, be children, uh, young adults like yourselves, uh, healthcare professionals, policy makers, etc., about the world of microbiology, linking it into infection biology, and then at an end point, antibiotic resistance, uh, which, is, which is what my research um, focuses on. So, um, Matthias, by trade, uh, is, is an immunologist, and that's where the, the infection biology side of things comes into. But primarily, superbugs at the minute is, is microbiology and AMR focused. So what I'm going to do is just give you some examples of some of the very basic things that we perhaps um, use to communicate some of the more basics of microbiology um, with, our, with our audiences. And then we'll perhaps give you a feeling of why we do do this and why we pitch it in that way at the end. And what we'll be doing is touching, using those very basic examples to touch on very briefly areas of research that are happening both in Cardiff, Bristol and, and across the uh, across the sort of micro, microbiology research community. So if I share my screen, can you all see that? Someone can give me a thumbs up, that'd be great. Uh, yes, John. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, as mentioned, Superbugs uh, is funded by the Wellcome Trust, and and I was previously at Cardiff University, now at Bristol. So it's a collaboration between Bristol and Cardiff University. Uh, these are the three um, core team members, uh, and, and beyond that, we have a, an army of volunteers without whom Superbugs and, and the projects we've delivered up to now which just wouldn't be possible. But I've introduced myself. Uh, this is Sarah Hatch, who's the Public Engagement Manager for the School of Medicine. And if you, if, if you do come and study in the School of Medicine and you're interested in communication and how, how we sort of um, talk and, and, and influence people in regards to science, then you will come into contact with Sarah. And then we've mentioned Matthias, uh, who, again, I don't know whether he will be joining us or not. He's having some IT gremlins. Uh, we're all at the whim of IT gremlins nowadays. So, um, as I said, we'll, we'll briefly show you some examples of things that we use to communicate with our audience. And the first thing I want to talk about is something we term the microbial world, because we, we like to very arrogantly talk about our Earth being 
us as the dominant species, but that, that's really not the case. Um, we aren't the dominant species on the planet. We're not the dominant organism. That is very much bacteria, viruses, and fungi, or what we would term the microbial world. Um, and as a very, very sort of uh, crude example of this, what we use is uh, an environmental sampling um, experiment to sort of show you the hidden places that, that this microbial world can, can, can live and thrive. So um, what I did was I swabbed all of these different parts. So I, I took a cotton swab, run it along certain environments that you can see on the slide, and then spread that swab on what we call an agar plate. It's a, it's a jelly plate full of nutrients, essentially an all-you-can-eat buffet for bacteria and, and um, other microbial organisms. So moving from left to right, what we have is uh, soil, um, just off the off this little stream under a tree, we've got uh, my dog. It's not. This isn't just an excuse to get a very cute photo of my dog on a slide. There is a reason that I put <laughs> sw swabbed his mouth. Uh, we've got this very disgusting looking microwave from one of the kitchens in work. We've got this door handle from work, and we've got a toilet. Um, I will say that the toilet there looks very very clean. It wasn't that clean when I swabbed it, so spare a thought for my. For myself, I, I thought, given this early in the morning, it may not be best to, to share with you the realities of what I actually swabbed. Um, but so what we did was we swabbed, I swabbed these five uh, environments and put them on that all-you-can-eat buffet, that sort of jelly agar that's the food of, of bacteria. And I've grown them up overnight. So I've put them into what we call an incubator, heat, where it keeps a temp constant temperature of about 37 degrees, our body temperature, and then I've taken some pictures of what resulted from that growth. And I just want to gauge how perhaps, how well you understand the, the overall concept of the microbial world by asking you some basic questions. So if you can go to this link for me, whether it, so if, if, you're, if you're there individually and you have a tablet or phone, uh, you, you can do this yourselves. If you're attending as a class, perhaps come to a consensus answer and, and just vote with that. But if you go to www.menti.com and then enter the code that you can see on the slide and then answer this question, which location out of the five I've just described do you think will have the most microbial growth? So the most bacteria, the most microbial organisms growing uh, in it. And we've got the tree and the soil, my, my dog's mouth, the microwave, the door handle and the toilet. So I'll just give you maybe a 30 seconds or 45 seconds to, to have a little look at that. Because I'm sharing the screen, I can't see how many attendees we have um, to know how many votes we're waiting on. One, two, so we've got about eight. And panelists, feel free to join in as well. maybe give you another 10, 15 seconds. So we've got three for tree and soil. We've got one for my dog's mouth, none for the microwave with the door handle and one for the toilet. And feel free, we're gonna discuss these, but feel free to put in the chat your reasoning behind why you chose the option that you did. Okay, so if we move on to the next question. So first of all, I asked you, what has the most growth in it? Now, I want you to answer the question, which of these locations do you think will have the biggest variety, the biggest diversity of growth? <coughs> Apologies for my coughing. I'm, I've still got the, the, the COVID cough. Okay, a bit more diversity there. So with tree and soil still coming out on top, two for dog's mouth and we've got one for the door handle. Interesting, the toilet has, has dropped off and, and none for the microwave still. Okay, maybe we'll give you 10 more seconds. This is your 10 second warning. Oh, another boost for tree and soil and, and my dog's mouth. Okay, great. Right, 
So, uh, as you can see, tree and soil came out on top in, in, in both instances. Okay, it's closely followed by, um, well, it's a little bit more even in most microbial growth here. Interesting, someone thought that I, I, if that is true, I won't be using the microwave anymore in, in work. Uh, but dog's mouth is coming a, a very, um, very easy second in regards to variety. Okay. So we're going to have a look at what I grew from each of these locations now. So this is the plate that I grew from the soil on the side of this little stream from the bottom of a tree. As you can see, lots of um, lots of growth. We've got um, large white colonies, large yellow colonies. There was grey colonies, very small, like what we call pinpoint colonies on that. And there was even on a second plate some uh, some fungus, but I didn't want to sort of uh, open that up to take a picture because fungi replicate by spores and I didn't want to contaminate the entire lab with, with fungal spores. I'd be I'd be thrown out of the building. So but what you can see is quite a lot of growth from, from that from that soil or what we would call an environmental swab. This is the swab for my dog's mouth. This should really tell you two things. Firstly, I need to brush my dog's teeth more at perhaps, uh, but secondly that my dog has a lot of a lot of bacteria in its mouth. Number three is the microwave. And what you can see on this plate is that we had no growth whatsoever. And to be honest, that's exactly what we'd be expecting. Um, what happens when you put food into a microwave, you're blasting the food with microwaves, radiation to heat it up, to cook it. And that the combination of that radiation and that heat essentially um, sterilizes the inside of the microwave. It kills off any contaminant microbial growth that may find its way in there. So it kills it off before it can then multiply in, into larger communities. So it's really no surprise that we didn't see any growth in, in the microwave. This is the swab from the door handle. So what you can see is a large colony here, a large colony here, and then there's a couple of small colonies about two thirds of the way up the plate. So you may think, well, that's, that's all right. That's not a lot of growth at all. But this is very, stuff like this is really very important when it comes to infection control, because whilst I'm saying there's one colony there, each colony on an agar plate like this consists of millions and millions and millions of individual bacterial cells. And in many of the bacterial pathogens, the, the disease causing organisms that we see in our hospitals, it only takes 10, maybe 100 cells to get into a patient to cause infection. So if on a door handle, you can find millions and millions and millions, that hopefully tells you how easily these potential pathog pathogenic bacteria, these potential disease causing bacteria can spread through, through buildings, through hospitals. And so a lot of work in, in research and science communication is around understanding these, what we call these routes of spread and trying to minimize those routes of spread, whether that be um, what cleaning products we use or the behavior of the staff in regards to not using your hands on taps or door handles, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that goes into the strategy behind limiting this spread. And you will come in touch with that sort of research within, um, within the School of Medicine and the wider research community in Cardiff. Here's the toilet, um, quite a lot of growth. As I said, the toilet in this picture looks clean. The toilet I swab wasn't, not, not after my use, I should perhaps add, um, but quite a lot of growth here. And again, perhaps not surprising because to use a non-vulgar term, we use the toilet to go number two, which comes from our gut. Uh, the, 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 what, what we release with the number two comes from our gut. And our gut is the most densely populated environment on the planet. There's trillions of microbial organisms, bacteria, fungi within your gut. So, and some of that is shed when you go to the toilet. So it's very, very unsurprising that when you're swabbing a dirty toilet, you would find a pretty high, um, content of 
of microbial growth on that plate. Okay, but a lot of these are what, we, are, well, most of these are what we would term commensal organisms. That means they grow on us naturally and actually often we take a benefit from them. So the, the, the microorganisms that grow in our gut help us digest food. They're there for a very good reason. We allow them to be there. Our, our immune system tolerates them for a very good reason because they give us the benefit of breaking down our food into all of the sort of the, the, um, the, the molecules the food is made of so that our body can then use those molecules for our own nutrition. Okay, so that's a very brief walkthrough of the plates that we looked at. Um, <coughs> pardon me. So back to those original questions, we asked what had the most microbial growth. Um, and the, the winner was the tree or the soil in the vault. What did the plates actually show? Well, the plates actually showed it was the dog's mouth. Now, in this six very crude experiment that is the case and that's not surprising because as i've just said even in our gut we have trillions and trillions of cells we are covered and animals like my dog are covered in microorganisms to the point where if you were to count all of the microorganism cells on your body and then count all of the human cells there would be more microorganisms in and on you than human cells so you're actually more microorganism than you are human and so particularly with animals that don't practice hygiene like dogs, it's unsurprising that within my dog's mouth, there was a really, really dense population of microorganisms. There wasn't much variety there because there is a limited number of bacteria that are specifically evolved to grow in our or dog's mouth. OK, it's, it's a relatively stable environment which favours a, a single evolutionary line, a single group of organisms that were evolved for that environment. So that's why we saw lots of growth, but perhaps not much variety. If, if you remember, it was just mainly rich yellow colonies. So the most variety of growth, we had tree and soil as the winner in the vote. And you are correct. That is what we saw the most variety in. Now, why is that? Out in the environment, we see a, a, a much, much wider diversity of microorganisms than what we would see in our body. That is because our body is designed to stay a very stable environment, as I just used the example of our mouth. Out in the environment, obviously conditions like uh, temperature, humidity, amount of water available, that fluctuates massively. And within that environment, you've got lots of what we call micro environments. So the conditions on one side of a tree may not be the same conditions on the other side of the tree. Or conditions in this part, patch of soil won't necessarily be the same conditions in a patch of soil a meter away. So because you've got all of those variations, what you see is loads and loads of different microorganisms evolving into each of those different environmental conditions, okay? So it's perhaps not surprising that um, we, we, we saw the most variety of growth in the tree and the soil. So well done for that. Um, and a lot of the work, a, a lot of research looks into these, ver these large various communities of microorganisms to see how they interact, because that helps us understand how our body interacts with pathogenic bacteria and how pathogenic bacteria or disease causing bacteria interact with our natural good bacteria that grow within us. So we're applying what we're learning within the environment to clinical areas to help us understand the, the dynamics of disease causing organisms. <coughs> okay, so that's an example of a very crude experiment we would use to communicate how variable and how sort of um, across the board microbial communities are, hence the term a microbial world. I want to touch now on an aspect of what my research is and where a lot of research in microbiology focuses and a lot of research within Cardiff focuses. Um, and if you come and study, you'll have, um, you'll have opportunities to sort of engage and, and work in this area. And it's detecting and understanding AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So 
we're able to detect what we would term resistance by a, by a, a technique that we call antibiotic susceptibility testing. Now, don't worry about all the text on the slide. Essentially, what this means is we take an antibiotic, we take a disease-causing bacteria, we expose that bacteria to the antibiotic, and we see what happens. That's the crux of it, okay? Now, on the, on the slide, in the picture, what I'm showing you is one particular technique of doing that. So the yellow or orangey disc that you see here, that's a cartoon image of an agar plate, similar to what we've just seen. The orange colour is where we would grow bacteria across the entire plate. And then what we can do is on top of that bacteria growth, put this white disc. It's a cardboard disc that contains antibiotic. And then, similar to what I did with those environmental plates, we put those plates in an incubator and grow that bacteria up to see how it responds to the antibiotic. And what happens is the antibiotic moves from that white disc out into the agar, out into the plate so that we can see what effect it has on the bacteria. And this is the sort of thing that is done routinely in clinical laboratories, because what it does is it tells us whether a bacteria is affected in a good way or bad way by the, by the antibiotic. And we'll have a look at some examples of this now to sort of illustrate this. So rather than the cartoon example of just a single disc, what you've got here is an agar plate this yellowy area is the bacteria growth, and the white discs are lots of different antibiotics. Now, what you can see is these clear zones. These are what we call zones of inhibition or zones of killing. This is where the antibiotic has dissolved out from the disc into the surrounding areas and killed the bacteria. Now, obviously, if you're wanting to treat an infection, that's a good thing. You want an antibiotic that kills the infection. That's what we term susceptible. If you see large zones of inhibition, that tells us that back, this bacteria is susceptible to that antibiotic. So that antibiotic would be a useful antibiotic to treat the infection. The alternative is what we term resistant. And you can see an example of this here, where around the antibiotic disc, there's no, exam, there's no um, example of killing. There's no zone of killing. So what that tells us is the antibiotic is having no effect on the, this bacterial isolate, this bacterial pathogen. <coughs> and obviously, if that antibiotic is having no effect, then you're not going to try and treat the infection with it. So these sort of very simple tests are used daily in clinical laboratories to provide information to clinicians to know what antibiotics will work and won't work in treating a patient. So there's lots and lots of research, both in understanding how bacteria become resistant to these antibiotics, but also lots of research in improving the ac accuracy of these tests and the speed of these tests. Because if we can identify what antibiotics will work more accurately and more quickly, that means clinicians can prescribe and start using antibiotics on patients more quickly so that patients get treated more quickly. It's all about clinical endpoint. So there's a lot of research going into to, to sort of um, identifying and detecting AMR. And again, that's something that you, you perhaps will be able to, to get um, experience of if you study uh, if you study in Cardiff. I want to come full circle. Um, we started off by looking at that crude example of environmental sampling and taking swabs from the environment. Um, and I've just talked to you about antibiotic resistance, where bacteria that cause infection may not be affected by the antibiotics, so we can't treat them with that, that particular antibiotic. And AMR as a global issue is increasing rapidly. We're increasingly seeing infections by bacteria that can't be treated by most of our antibio the antibiotics that we would use clinically. So a lot of money in microbial research is going into finding new antibiotics so that we can treat these resistant infections. And one of the richest sources that we can hunt for new antibiotics is actually in the environment. The earliest antibiotics came from environmental organisms. Bacteria and fungi produce antibiotics naturally to defend themselves, to kill other bacteria in the environment.
So we, we're, we're going back to look in into the environment to see whether any of those natural antibiotics can be used and evolved and improved to be used in clinical environments. I just wanted to show you an example of, of a very simple environmental sampling that shows or hints at the potential of this approach. So what we have here is dots of different environmental organisms. And what we're doing is essentially looking for those zones of killing again to see whether these environmental organisms will kill the infection, uh, infectious bacteria. And I've highlighted in two circles, they may be a little bit difficult for you to see, but you can see around these colonies, very small zones of inhibition, zones of killing. What that's telling us is that the organism in this large blob, this colony, is producing something that is killing the bacteria around it. So we can take that organism and start researching exactly what it's producing to have that killing effect. And again, that's research that's being done in Cardiff and more widely in the microbial research community. Okay, so very, very briefly, and then we'll open up the questions. Um, why am I giving you some examples of this very sort of relatively crude um, microbial communication uh, that, that we carry out in superbugs? I mentioned at the very top of the presentation that super, this presentation is going to be a little bit of a change of pace because superbugs isn't interested primarily in lab based research. We are interested in researching what the most effective ways of communicating microbiology, AMR, and the research done in that field is. Because we have to be able to communicate our findings to various, uh, various audiences to impart positive change. So for instance, we may want to um, communicate the importance of, of um, washing your hands and minimizing the infection control, for, as we saw with the door handle, to healthcare professionals. So to be able to do that properly, we need to understand the best ways of communicating that basic science to healthcare professionals. One of the things that really helps the spread of antibiotic resistance is people not taking a full course of antibiotics or prescribing or GPs prescribing the wrong antibiotics, perhaps. So they're two very different audiences, the general public and GPs. And we have to understand how to communicate the same information about the, the, the dangers of not taking the correct or full courses of antibiotics to two very different audiences. And that's what we're trying to understand and research in superbugs, the best ways to communicate that science. And in, all, in most cases, that is taking the science back to its very most basic form, which is what I've tried to at least illustrate in some of the examples we've shown you today. Um, so, I perhaps I'll stop sharing, um, stop sharing the presentation. I just want to very uh, briefly for the next minute or two to show you um, what our latest project has been. Um, well, actually, is Matthias with us? Matthias, you here? He's in the chat, but I don't know if he can communicate. No? Okay, so what I wanted to do is just very briefly share with you. Um, I'm putting it in the, the link in the chat show you what we've produced in our latest project. Uh, can I put it in the chat, uh, Mike? Uh, if My chat doesn't seem to be working. It's disabled for the attendees, the chat. Put it in the Q&A. Okay, well, they'll be able to see the, um, the link when I, when I share the screen, don't worry. Okay, can you see this screen, everybody? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Perfect, thanks. So this is what we've produced in the latest project of Superbugs. And this is an online digital tool aimed at communicating and, and engaging various audiences with microbiology, AMR, and infection biology um, across the same topics we tried to communicate it in person, but doing it online. And we this was co-produced both with pupils across South Wales and teachers. 
And that is one aspect that is very, very much undervalued across all science in co-producing scientific research and co-producing how you communicate that with the audience you're trying to have a positive effect on. So the, the aim of this project really was to use those audiences to help us um, produce this website. So uh, for those of you that may be interested, um, the, the address is simply superbugs.online. So please do feel free, free, free to, um, to have a look uh, and, and explore. Um, I'll perhaps show you just some of the, some of the aspects that we, we currently have up online. The main heart of the website is what we call your Superbugs adventure. So if I just click on that, this is a, an activity trail essentially where we, we um, teach you about lots of varying aspects of, of microbiology and AMR through activities, quizzes, computer games, etc. And it's very much taken the strategy that I've just explained in that we've, rather than assuming knowledge about what bacteria are, uh, what fungi are, what antibiotics are, etc., we start from the very basics of how life evolved, moving into introducing you to the science of microbiology, what we mean by microbiology, and introducing you to what actually what bacteria are, <coughs> pardon me, um, and then going through various stages, building up the knowledge very, very basically, until we get onto the more complex topics of antibiotic resistance, vaccines, etc. So, um, all of these different state, all these different steps involve, as I said, quizzes, um, interactive games, uh, computer games, etc. So, please do have an explore. What we found in all of our projects is that. Um, whilst perhaps targeting certain age groups, the, the material we produce is actually informative in different ways across anyone ranging from the age of three or four all the way up to their early 20s and even the age of sort of more elderly parents. So this is very much a tool, um, tool for everyone. Uh, what may be of interest to you guys is an area that we call being a scientist, where essentially we have a whole collection of very successful, diverse scientists um, from varying backgrounds, giving you an idea of what their job entails on a day-to-day -day basis, what they do, what areas they work in, and also a bit about their career pathway, how they, how they got to where they are now. And that may be interesting for you guys to have a look at if any of these people are working in areas that, you, that you're interested in. Um, we also then have a, um, but his is going to kill me that I can't remember where this is. Bear with me. There we go. Click the wrong link. We then also have a, a story trail, which perhaps introduces you to more historical aspects of science and, uh, and sort of giving you an insight how, in how, to modern, how modern science evolved to where it is from often very basic beginnings. So um, I, these, these pages are constantly gonna be updated to new stories and activities, etc. cetera. So um, please feel free to have a look. I'm gonna stop sharing there. Um, so that's just a very, very brief, um, brief look at what we've what we produced essentially over the pandemic, whilst our ability to to put on face to face uh, events obviously was a little bit halted due to due to lockdowns. Um, <coughs> again, apologies for the cough. I, I'll I'll stop it there. Um, if we have any questions, I'd be more than happy to um, to take questions either from panelists or attendees on anything in regards to the sort of the communication superbugs side of things, or even the lab based more pure research uh, topics that I, that I touched on through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you indeed, John. That's a really exciting development there. Um, uh, we've got a question um, about um, the COVID vaccine, the fact that it was possible to develop a COVID vaccine in just over a year. Why is it so difficult to develop new drugs to tackle antibiotic resistance? Um, how long have you got? Um, okay. There's a couple of reasons. Um, 
one of the major issues is simply money and time. It takes a long, long time from discovering that first drug to evolving and improving that drug to the point where it's not only effective at killing bacteria, but it's actually safe to give to patients. That is a very long, drawn up process, 15, 20, maybe 25 years. Also, because it takes so long, it takes a lot of money, millions upon millions upon millions of pounds. So you're expecting pharmaceutical companies to put a lot of money into developing those drugs. The issue then becomes for the pharmaceutical company, profit. They aren't going to make a profit until the antibiotic is actually used in the clinic. And a patient will perhaps take an antibiotic for, for two weeks. So per patient, you're getting two weeks of profit. Compared that perhaps to a diabetic drug, where a patient will take a diabetic drug for the rest of their life. So if a pharmaceutical company puts its money into a diabetic drug instead, rather than two weeks of profit, you actually get a lifetime of profit. So very coldly and clinically, a lot of the time, this decision-making process just simply comes down to the profit. From a scientific point of view, the difficulty is developing completely new types of antibiotic. Most of the new antibiotics we see into the clinic now are just very slightly changed versions of antibiotics that we already have. And what that means is that if a bacteria is resistant to that already existing antibiotic, if we make a slight change to that antibiotic, the bacteria also only needs to make a slight change to become resistant, which often means these new antibiotics are used for maybe a couple of years before we then start seeing the problem of resistance arise again. So they're, they're the two major issues, money and finding a completely new idea that avoids how bacteria currently become resistant. Thank you, John. Um, there's a question about good bacteria and bad bacteria. You know, yeah. You hear about that in the news. Can you explain the difference? And uh, are these important in, in the context of developing antibiotics? Um, yeah, so good bacteria are, it's essentially one cell, that's what it says on the tin. Good bacteria are bacteria that have some sort of benefit to us. So the example I used was gut bacteria. The bacteria in our gut are there to help us digest food. So they are what we would term good bacteria. Bad bacteria are those that do the complete opposite. So they cause, cause infection. Now in regards to sort of um, developing antibiotics and using antibiotics, having all of those good bacteria often means there's not enough space and there's not enough food for bad bacteria to sort of get a foothold and create an infection. Okay, because they're sort of barged out of the way by those good bacteria. But often what we find is that if you go into a hospital or go to GP with an infection and we treat the infection, those antibiotics often don't only kill your bad bacteria, they'll also kill off quite a lot of your good bacteria. And if we're killing off a lot of your good bacteria, that means there's more space for more bad bacteria to come in without being elbowed to the side or out what we would term outcompeted. So often what we will see is antibiotic therapy actually may lead to a secondary infection if that therapy isn't monitored um, and, 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 and sort of dosed appropriately. And that's partly why we, we need to sort of improve the communication around how we use and dose and prescribe antibiotics. Great, thank you for that, John. Um, whilst we wait for more questions to come in, perhaps I could ask one myself, John. And uh, we often read about how antibiotics are used in uh, the context of uh, animal husbandry in the agricultural uh, uh, industry. Uh, yeah. So can you just update us on, on you know, what, what, why they're used and uh, is there any measures being taken to limit the usage in the context of animal husbandry? <laughs> Um, yeah, well, a great question. And, and some of my research is involved in how we communicate the issue of AMR to farmers uh, right. for this exact reason. So, yes, antibiotics are used in agriculture and, and, and veterinary areas, of sort of farming, for instance. And they're actually, that's a, a, that uses more antibiotics than we do clinically, globally. Um, and the problem is that they're not always used to treat infection. They're given to 
animals that aren't showing any signs of illness to stop them from becoming ill. It's what we call sort of prophylactic treatment. We're going to give you these antibiotics now to stop an infection from starting. But what that does is that actually helps resistance evolve. Um, so what we have to do is sort of monitor and really tightly regulate how antibiotics are used within those agricultural settings. Now, that perhaps isn't too much of an issue in the UK. We have quite good regulations. But in developing countries, often there's no regulations. So they're using antibiotics unregulated and uncontrolled. What that means is often in developing countries is where we see new types of antibiotic resistance emerge before then spreading globally. So it's all very well and good as doing it in the UK, but if we don't have a global approach to, to controlling that, then we're going to run into problems, which is exactly what we're doing. So a lot of, um, as a, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm involved in it myself. A lot of research on the, the policy making and the communication of AMR involves trying to engage those demographics in developing countries so that we can start to bring in those rules and regulations. And of course, MRSA has been a big issue in in in, in the healthcare set you know sector in the UK in recent years. Are we closer to 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 minimising the, the 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 risk uh, with that particular um, form of bacteria? Yes. Yeah, so um, you know, we touched on on the door handle and the importance of infection control. So MRSA was traditionally seen as the major hospital superbug. Um, but because we identified the roots of spread in regards to um, door handles and touching beds and touching other patients and transferring bugs across wards in, through those means, we identified the importance of hand washing. So what the government has done over the last maybe 10, 15, 20 years is bring in um, campaigns to improve the communication and the knowledge around proper hand washing protocols. That's why now you see ethanol washes and you, at, at the entrance of each ward in hospitals, etc. And what that's done is it's brought down the rates of MRSA massively within our hospitals to the point where it could be argued that MRSA now isn't the major threat within our hospital environments that, that it once was. And that's all down. It's, it's, it's no real difference in, in how we treat MRSA. It's all down to those infection control measures of simply washing hands, etc. Excellent. Thank you, John. John, perhaps you could just, to, to finish off things, you could just clarify um, something for yeah. one of our attendees. Uh, my dad always says that no two colds are the same. Is this true? If so, do we need a different set of antibiotics for every cold? So if you can uh, just clear that one up for us, please. Yeah, you'll, you'll never need antibiotic. Well, I, won't, I should never say never. But in the most instances, you won't need antibiotics for a cold because the common cold isn't caused by bacterial organisms and, and antibiotics are used to treat bacteria specifically. Then they're, they're not necessarily effect well, they're not effective against fungi and they're not effective against viruses, which are the causative organisms of most of the common colds that are the illnesses that cause common cold symptoms that we see. And and that's a really great question in illustrating what I mentioned earlier about bringing the communication of these topics back to the very, very basics. Because if you don't understand that antibiotics, for instance, are only effective against bacteria, so you don't understand how antibiotics work, then it's pointless sermoning and lecturing about antibiotic resistance. You need to bring it right back and explain to people the difference between what a bacteria and a virus is, what an antibiotic is and how it works, so that people can understand those fundamentals which will then help them understand the, the threat of AMR and, and what we're trying to do to combat it. So yeah, great, great question. Great, well, uh, thanks again uh, for your contributions to our event, John. It's clear that you're not fully over your COVID infection. And we really, no. we yeah. really do appreciate um, your commitment to, uh, to partake this morning. No problem, uh, and, my uh, pleasure. All the very best with the, uh, the Superbugs project. Uh, so thanks, Jim. Th thanks everyone, much appreciate it. Have great. a good, great day. I'd just like to remind our participants that we're now going to have a short break of uh, 15 minutes and then we'll be recommencing at 11 uh, with a panel of our PhD and uh, undergraduate medical students from uh, Cardiff University who will um, try to field uh, your questions. So see you all shortly in 15 minutes. <laughs>